Hello, I'm Herm Gailey. We're here to do a segment on what I call stripped down groundwork. Now my original plan was to do this in my boots, my spurs, and my undershorts. But there was a family meeting convened and I was overruled and I think all of you owe the family a vote of thanks for that. What I mean by stripped down groundwork is there is a school of thought in what has come to be known as natural horsemanship that says more groundwork is always better and groundwork becomes an end in itself. My goal with groundwork is to make the horse more pleasant and more controllable and more cooperative to be around and to also in a young horse like this yearling that I'm working with here to also get him more prepared to do his job when you saddle him and start to ride him. I, I, I said to my wife one time, I, I don't know how much I want to do on a groundwork video because I don't work on groundwork that much. She says, every time you work, walk your horse in from the pasture, whether you know it or not, you're working on groundwork, you're always fixing this or that. That's where a lot of my groundwork gets done. I don't set aside a segment of time saying, now we're going to do groundwork and it becomes like a circus trick you're doing. It, now it becomes part of their life. So a couple years ago, three years ago about, I had the opportunity to attend a clinic with Chris Cox and I very much wanted to get a feel for his groundwork technique because based on what I've seen on his TV show and so forth, his goal is similar to mine not to spend a horse's whole life teaching them how to do things from a cookbook, but teach them to be responsive, teach them to be responsible for themselves, and to get them more ready as a riding horse. So what I noticed that Chris Cox does and what he confirmed is, he doesn't go through the usual sequence of moving your horse around you and getting them to yield one body part at a time, he begins to soften the whole horse through their rib cage. Now, if I was as good as Chris Cox, that's exactly what I'd do. I'm not, and I don't. What I tend to do is I'll ask them first to learn to move their backside over. But what I want, and what he's given me really here is, I want him to yield his body away from me and soften. And you'll notice, the only thing I have is my hands and my lead rope. I'm using a rope holder. You don't need a rope holder. You probably ought to have a nice long lead. This one's 14 feet. 12 feet would be minimum. More than 14, you're going to be getting tangled up in ropes. But what I want to do is I want him to not pull on me and to shift around and face me if I put pressure on him. That prepares your horse for so many things in his life. He's going to tie up better. He's going to be lighter to lead. He's not going to pull back when you do things with him. He's learning to be softer. Now, I thought I had this holder adjusted when I put it on him. Looks like it wouldn't be a bad idea to draw that up a little bit because it's not really up underneath his jaw. You want that back piece of your halter. I'll shift around here in a moment. You want that back piece of the halter to be at or very close to being underneath their jawbone back here. If it's hanging down there, it's really got too much slack. So what I want to do, I will first say, can you face me? And you can see he's shifting his hips more to face me. And as time goes by, I start saying, move your whole body over move your whole body over and we'll do that again and I'll ask my camera lady to shift to his front feet you actually want him to move his rib cage and his shoulders and his hips and he should actually be crossing over with his front feet and if he falls backwards you're getting too much there you go so what I'll do and what I really learned from the, the clinic I took with Chris Cox is, I'll concentrate on this stuff. Now I'll do it both ways, obviously, but 
for this video as I've been doing in other segments, I'm going to work on one side and you can figure out how it would look on the other side. And that way I don't use as much of your time up. But what Chris Cox says is get them really good at this before you drive them around you. And that has been a revelation to me. Because what I used to have a tendency to do was to drive my horse around me and I'd get a pretty stiff response. Now this colt is pretty reactive. One thing you want to do is have some idea what you're dealing with with your horse because it will be revealed in your groundwork. This colt we bought as a weanling. He's now about 16 months old. He came from a sale at the Open Box Rafter Ranch along with a filly. They arrived on the same day. They grew up the same way and they are very different horses. This colt here makes up his own mind about things, takes care of himself. The filly works more off trust. If she trusts you, she'll do about anything, but she relies on you. This colt's gonna make an absolutely great cross country horse because what he'll be able to do is when he's in a tight spot and you don't know what to do, you throw him some slack, I bet he'll figure it out. Problem is, and it's not really a problem, he needs to figure things out for himself. He's not just going to accept that it's okay because you're asking him to do it. But that's where you want him. Now, he's been pretty good about this, but we're going to try to cut in some video here from back when I was first working on this. And you can see this colt said, that's not what I had in mind. He decided the way out of it was to straighten his head up and leave town. And you really needed to wrestle with him to get him to yield. So you do what you need to do. You work on driving that hip till he faces you, and then you can start moving the whole horse over. See, that's... Believe me. Amen. Now see, I've got to keep his face over here. See, that's nice. Doesn't have to be real dramatic. That's your own poop there, buddy. So then what you want to do is show them a direction. And you may get some of that. You show them a direction. And you see if they can work their way around you and still say stay soft see how he's not leaving me his eye is in on me he's in a pleasing round shape and that's what you want now he's going to tend to stall because he's only done this a certain amount but you can see then instead of going around like a lot of horses who are being quote lunged he's given me some shape He's given me some shape. He's not taking his head to the outside and just thundering around like horses do when you go to, you know, to the feed store by yourself a 30, 30 foot rope and a, uh, a big whip and you whip them over the butt and they charge around you with their head to the outside and on the wrong lead. That's just awful. I like the shorter rope and I like being able to just direct them and drive them forward. So what I'm doing, I'm using this hand as my start cue, and it's almost like you would do with your rein when you show them where to go, and then you add some forward impulsion, and he'll get confused, and that's okay, let him study it. There you go. And all of that, interestingly enough, I got zero of that kind of response with the filly. And I got a whole lot of that with him because he needs to figure it out for himself. I'm okay with that, I respect that.
we're determined to get this halter pulled a little too long. So I'm going to make it a little too short and see if that gets us about where we need to be. So I don't want this horse scared of me. I want him responsive. There's a balance there as in everything. That may be a little too short, but I bet it'll get longer. These halters grow. So after you've chased them around just a little bit like that, after you've established that sensitivity, after they're very ready to move for you like that, then you need to make sure you don't have their anxiety level up. So what I will do, move your hip. <laughs> See, he's pretty reactive. I don't hold that against him at all. Reactive becomes responsive. And over a lifetime, that's gonna be a good thing. But he says, how do I feel about having you put that rope on my back? Well, you've just been chasing me with that rope. I don't trust it. I don't blame you, buddy. Now what I'll do is I'll flip the rope over his back. I'm not gonna stand here and pitch the rope at him again and again. Cause that can get just a little too radical, but I'm going to put it over his back to where I've got it in a more controlled position and I can just sort of flip it around as opposed to standing back and heaving it over him. You want to be able to heave it over him, but I'm not sure that that's what I need to do with him anytime today, certainly not right now. So there you go. Now, if he moves around, see how he's coming in on me? I want to have enough control that I can drive him away just like that. Because when they get in close, when they get up close and personal, that's when they, they, they kind of get the drop on you and they'll run over you. But you can see if he does that, I can drive him back out. And I'm going to ask him to stop. We're getting all over the pen here, but that's okay. Doing groundwork, you'll cover some, cover some ground. You could do this in a round pen where you're a little more contained if you thought your horse might actually pull away from you. I don't think that's gonna happen. So I wanna take that apprehensiveness away. I will share with you that because he was pretty resistant early on, I drove him pretty hard to get him to yield. And I've got him a little anxious about what I do with him. That's a side effect that I wish I hadn't created, and if I had done it perfectly, I wouldn't have. But it's also something that I'm going to keep that responsiveness and get rid of some of that overreaction and end up with a horse that is well balanced. It goes back to an earlier segment that a horse needs to have an on off switch. Right now, we're working on the off switch to get him to where if you need to do something, he doesn't get troubled. So if he moves when I'm doing this, I'm gonna keep doing it until he finds the right answer is not to move, and then I'll quit. He also thinks it might be an advantage to him if he w worked his way over to the driveway and maybe, maybe left the pen altogether. So we'll fix that. And see, he's got that apprehension, but that's part of what you work through. So you work on getting him responsive, which he was, moving away, and then you get him to where he doesn't overreact. There, he stopped, I'll stop. He stopped, he's relaxed, and it's also starting to rain which I could care less about, but I'm a little worried about our equipment. Are we okay so far? We're okay, all right. Now, as long as it doesn't get any worse than this, I'll show you one other thing that I like to do during early groundwork. And that is, I absolutely think a horse needs to know how to back up. This is the one time when I like to use a stick. So we're gonna come back and use a stick in a couple of minutes after this shower works its way through. 
So we're back after a break and you can see that Slim has a wet backside and actually so do I. This isn't Slim, sorry, this is Mike. Mike has a wet backside and so do I, but we're both living through it. Our camera might not have, so we took a little break. Where we were was talking about using a stick and when I do. It is not critical to use a stick ever, but I like to use a stick when I back one up. It makes my arm a little longer. There are times when you're backing a horse up and you're sort of agitating them to get back that they'll surge forward or if you've got a horse that's a little strong on the strike, they might paw you. This colt wouldn't do either of those two things, I don't believe, but I feel a little safer if my arm is this much longer. So what I'm gonna do, and this is kind of based on a Clinton Anderson thing, actually. When I want them to back up, I'm gonna ask them to back up very softly. Actually, that he gave me a step there. A little slow, so I'm just gonna tap the rope. Every time you put that on them to drive them, it's good to put it on them to relax them. See, he gave me some response, but it was on his time. And not to be ugly to him, but it needs to be on my time. And I think he had one session of this before. This is pretty new to him. I don't teach them to back up as quickly as some people do, as early as some people do. Because if you get a horse too dedicated to backing up, like everything else you teach them, they will use it against you. And they'll start falling backwards when you don't want them to. So I'm going to use my body and a little bit of rope. And there he's starting to back up. So I'm not going to use the stick on the, the rope at all. Give him a little bit of an incentive, a little slow. And I'm saying, you can, you can notch it up a little, buddy. I want him doing things softly and quietly, but I also don't want him sleepwalking his way through it. Okay, back, back. There you go. And see, I could do a lot more with him. That's enough for a young horse at this stage. So those are our components. I'm gonna lose the stick here. Observation on sticks. Interesting how the clinicians who are kind of preaching gentleness and endless love to your horse, the first doggone thing they want to sell you is a great big stick. So there you go. They have their places. So, component number one, you want to be able to drive your horse away from you, their whole body. You get that simply by starting with the hip, working your way forward till you can move each part together and they're shifting sideways. And you always want to be able to stop them in a position. See how he's lagging? I want his hip to speed up so he's facing me now, which he is. Then we move on to asking him to go around us. And he retains that softness that he's accumulated from that other process. And then you begin what with this cold is the bigger challenge and that is saying it's all okay don't be overreactive. So this is what I need to work on with this colt, and that's the information he gave me today was, uh, you need to spend more time getting me relaxed. I'm a little troubled. Really what he's doing is trying a little too hard. I don't hate him for that one little bit, but I am gonna work on it. So that's what he told me today. And I'm going to listen because if all I did was work on making him more responsive, I would get him overreactive. And then you finish up and you would normally be using your stick, but you want to get your horse to wear when you ask him to back up. They step away from you. And you can see the progress he made on that in a short time. That's also telling me that my choice to do that later rather than sooner was good 
because he has a certain aptitude for it. What you don't want is to get him to use that aptitude against you, which could have happened if I'd been pre premature on that. So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to finish this little session just by putting the rope over him again. See, he startles a little, but I'm getting him more quiet, not less. It's always good when your session ends with your horse one step quieter than you started. We're there. Mike, thank you. Thank you, folks. We'll see you next time.